This week, Kumar and Emmett review Lock and Key by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. There are a lot of murders in it, but is it a horror comic? Plus, in the second half of the show, lots of answered questions for those who have read Lock and Key but got lost, and missteps when the comic deals with race and sexuality. First, we're getting closer to unlocking a new podcast about the manga Fullmetal Alchemist, The Law of Equivalent Exchange. It's a chapter-by-chapter reading of the manga, with commentary on the translation, including the sound effects, and on how creator Hiromu Arakawa masterfully put together the story of Edward and Alphonse Elric. Patrick and I have already started recording the show, and we can't wait for you to hear it. If you're a fan of Fullmetal Alchemist, one of the best manga of the 21st century, pledge now at patreon.com slash deconcomics and help unlock the show. This is Kumar. This is Emmett. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Kumar and Emmett in Melbourne. Uh, normally we would be sitting face to face for these things. It's been a while since we've seen each other. Uh, I would have been like, yeah, it'd be cool to hook up and hang out like we usually do and record an episode in the course of the day. Uh, that is not happening. Because um, this is this episode and maybe the next two years of episodes are a little time capsule <laughs> of uh, us not being allowed to see each other. Um, because of the uh, the Trump virus that's going around. Oh, uh, I like it. Is that what we're calling it now? I yeah. like that. That's, <laughs> that's that's much better. Yeah. Uh, as as a form of counter propaganda, I yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, King John might be dead. That's another thing that we just don't happened. know. We don't know. Yes. <laughs> we don't... <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, the story has just happened, whether yes. or not it's real. Yeah, so uh, that's kind of the, the time capsule we're in. Now, um, how, are you, how are you doing? I'm good, man. Yeah, it's it's been a while since we spoke, and I, I assume it'll be a while before we meet, unless we uh, rely on the technology that everyone's forcing us to do use to do our day, day jobs, such as Zoom and MS Teams and Skype. Even I feel like Skype got lost in the mix. <laughs> yeah, these... I don't know why, because Zoom like feeds your data straight to Facebook, so yeah. it's like why why is everybody on this? It was very strange that. Mm, I've never heard about it, and then the next day everybody was using it, and I was like, oh, this is odd. So, uh, to answer your question, I I am in this sort of space of conducting all my relationships virtually right now. Um, (laughs) I don't leave home uh, unless I need to go shopping or drive the car around the block to make sure it doesn't die on me. I... uh, I I actually am doing a lot of shopping online as well, just like food and stuff, because there's like delivery companies that'll drop food outside our place, and um, um, I don't know how personal I I should get for this show because this is a comics conversation show. Um, but you know, I had a recent family tragedy. I had to travel overseas, and I was in quarantine for two weeks after that. Uh, so the world went mad. At the worst possible time for me. <laughs> yeah, I actually was worried about if you were going to be able to come back to Australia at the time. So was I. So yeah. we were in Ireland, and we were in Ireland for maybe a day. Yeah. And uh, so for the benefit of the listeners, I'll just say that my, my father, uh, Jared Cooney, passed away. And um, we had to run home for the funeral. And on the day of the funeral, um, we were in a church, and we couldn't sit together as a family. Like wow. no, one, we we had to sit in separate spaces, you know, and uh, mourners who knew Dad, very few came because the church was actively telling people don't come to funerals. Mm. So there was very few people there, but one or two folks I knew approached me and said, "Oh, uh, how was your how was your trip?" And I said, "Oh, thanks very much. We arrived last night." He said, "Okay, um, are you getting back in the plane and leaving today?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh no, we'd booked two weeks." And he said, no, I think you should go now. And right. Like it, it was very much get out now because the borders are closing. Yeah. So the word was out, you know. Okay. And so did you? So we were only you home. You left early. Yeah, we were only home for two days. Wow. 
So we were done for two days and then uh, jumped on a flight back to Melbourne. So uh, and we arrived and we were in quarantine for 14 days. And uh, um, the fact that everyone else in Victoria is in the same position as we are, uh, despite certain folks flaunting uh, the stay-at-home advice from the government, um, that most people I know are also at home. They're dealing with their kids. They're dealing with their jobs. They're doing everything at home. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll ask you how you're doing. Um, and we're all in this at the same time. That slightly helps me. Yeah. That slightly helps that we're at least all experiencing yeah. this common event. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, um, so my routine hasn't changed. Like, and, um, my son was doing some things before Christmas. He was doing swimming and tennis and he had an art class on Saturdays and I would drive him to those things. Mm. And, uh, around the same time he decided to quit all of those or one of them actually shut down. He's like, okay. So after, from January, I was like, okay, I'm, I don't leave the house Monday to Friday. And yeah. we would go out like once on Saturdays for a meal somewhere. And then once a month I would meet friends for board games or something like that. And that's the only thing that's really evaporated. And schedule wise, only one of my projects, uh, I was doing a certain series for Dark Horse and it had been delayed for like a couple of years. And then okay. they put it back on the schedule. He said, Hey, I've got big news. This series is coming back on the schedule. It's on for, I think this must have been in February or March. February, maybe he emailed me and he said it's back on. And then like six weeks later, he's like, sorry, it's off again. It's delayed again. So that's yeah. kind of been the only thing. Um, but I'll tell you a weird thing uh, that is comics related that has affected me is we're not being bombed. Um, and I'm constantly... In the back of my mind, all the time are those Josaka comics, especially Safe Fairy Garage Day is the one that oh, I'm thinking yeah. about all the time and how those people were living in the, the bombed out, you know, no water, no electricity, um, no heat. Uh, mm. and those, his comics are what I'm thinking about all the time here and I'm sitting around and, you know, I'm on, I, I'm a heavy Facebook user and I'm seeing all the memes and stuff and it's like everybody's going crazy, but I'm like, this is not, Especially for me, because my routine hasn't changed. But this is this is nothing. This is really we're not in a worse situation. Um, and I actually feel yeah, like those you, comics have prepared me. You, you're you're <laughs> suggesting that there's this stake of uh, outrage at personal inconvenience. Yeah. Uh, in the face of trying to do your duty for your fellow man and, and limit the possibility of exposure to others. Uh, that's been treated by folks as this huge hindrance on them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is horrible. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's the the state of things, and uh, we'll see where we are. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Australia is doing very well. Um, comparatively. Yeah. yeah. Comparatively. So who knows if? And since we're an island, you know, who knows how things might pan out? Maybe we'll be things will ease off a little bit, and um, maybe we will record face to face. Someday, sometime again. <laughs> um, uh, but until then, we, today we're talking about lock and key. Now, here's the thing. Yeah. I think there's a perfect segue here because okay. lock and key, I raised with you yeah. a few months ago now. We're saying, hey, I think we should talk about this uh, Joe Hill, Gabriel Rodriguez comic because it's been made into a Netflix show. Yes. What's the most popular company right now in the world? <laughs> Netflix. Yes. Because everyone's staying at home watching their netflix and yeah. lock and key came out to some popular uh response um i i, I wouldn't say acclaim because i think opinions on the show were mixed okay um but i have met a lot of people who've never read the comic who have approached me and said hey what do you think of the lock and key show they're all watching it uh -huh. so it's 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 getting out there so say what you will about the show and now we're going to talk about the comic, but I think it's actually managed. Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez's work has actually managed to reach more people, yeah, thanks to this Netflix deal, um, than perhaps would have happened otherwise. And you know, that's not to speak on the quality of the show. That's <laughs> it's the word is out. Lock and key is a thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't get around to watching it. I had plans to. 
Um, and then somehow today rolled around, and I don't know, I just somehow didn't... I kind of almost forgot that I had planned to sit down and watch at least the first episode today. Yeah. Um, but I also violated one of the tacit agreements of a relationship in that I texted you my opinion of the comic before we sat down. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> I saw that message like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because normally I like to come in cold and it's like, oh, what'd you think of the, you know, but, um, yeah, so I, uh, and, uh, I found it tiresome, um, reading it. Uh, and I think, uh, I think the, part of the problem was my expectations, because I saw, you see that cover, that kind of iconic cover of the house of the first issue or the first trade paperback all the time. And I was always like, I'm going to get around to this someday. Because um, I was expecting a horror comic or kind of a haunted house horror comic. Which it is. Which, to some well, degree. okay. Uh, sort of descriptives it, you could give to the it's, comic. Yeah, yeah, that's how, that's where you would shelve it for sure. Um, but, um, you know, for, Two volumes, three volumes. I was reading, reading, and it was, I was finding it very dull, but more I was finding it not scary. I didn't find any of it scary. And we've done some good horror comics in the last few months on this show. Scary horror comics. Um, and this was really just stuff happening and lots of details. So much, so much people talking about their feelings and there were a lot of chess pieces on the board that were like, and there were lots of lines of dialogue like, ah, but when you did that thing to Sally 30 years ago, and we don't know what that is for another 12 issues or whatever, um, it's just too much stuff to keep in your head, blah, blah, blah. Finally, around Volume 3, I um, there was this uh, moment where, I can't remember what issue it was, but there was a certain sequence where um, I think they introduced a whole bunch of keys in a row with even saying what they were. Um, it was just like a montage of new keys. Uh, we should explain what the keys are. But anyway, we'll get we'll get to all that. We'll get to all that. But then I realized, oh, this isn't the this isn't a horror comic. This is a dark fantasy. It's kind of yes. like uh, it's a it's a fun, I guess, thing for teenagers um, because there's no nudity, but there's tons of violence. So I'm assuming it's for people who aren't adults uh, and can't handle looking at naughty bits. Uh, but can handle a person being split in two down the middle or have their lip bitten off, uh, which is, seems to be what the 14-year-old kind of target media I is mean, like that's now. A, that's a very... That's a graphically disturbing panel of art from Rodriguez where uh, I believe it's Ellie Wade, well, Waden. Yeah. Uh, and she uh, she is uh, assaulted. Um, and again, this is a comic as well which deals, I would say, quite liberally with the idea of uh, rape um, on at least two or three occasions it's either it occurs off panel yeah. or it is threatened yeah. and uh, it's a comic as well which deals with race in a very tinnered way in one particular issue which I think <laughs> uh, got a lot of attention at the time uh, I was on the periphery of the comics journalism scene at that time and I remember when that came out and <laughs> there was a lot of sort of uh, stroking of beards as to what opinion should we have about this and I was like yeah look it's not good uh, <laughs> let's, let's just let's put all that aside yeah, this would be controversy. it's, it's yeah. not a well written uh, approach to the question of race uh, as as good as the intentions may or may not have been. I think um, the intentions were good. I think yeah, I'm, I don't think there was anything... I think it's sincere. I think the whole book is very sincere. I think it's like Saga, although my you know, my reaction isn't as vehemently opposed as it was. I'm not having as violent a reaction as I did to Saga. Cause I, maybe because there weren't um, like pictures of cosplay and self-congratulatory letters at the back of every volume or whatever. But there, yeah, there's a certain liberal self-satisfaction that comes through, even though yeah. I think this also to more, more so than um, Saga could, could ever claim to um, does reflect this sense of working class life in America uh, or at least tips its hat to it. There are occasional characters who are, you know, um, stuck in dead-end jobs and they're unpleasant people and there is a degree of empathy for them within right. the comic um, but then unpleasant things happen to them and there's this sense of there was no escape for them they never had a chance so that seems to reflect 
a sense of what it is to be working class in America in the 2000s. Or although I would say, and I, how do you feel? Oh, look, let's talk about the plot of the comic. But how would you say, where is this comic? What time is it actually set in? Because it takes place in the 2000s. Yeah. But for all the life, of, I I would I would maybe suggest the 90s. You know, even though there are things like mobile phones and email. Um, that are popularly available, but there's this sense of it being something like a movie or a horror novel from the eighties and nineties. There's this sense of the structure of the life of these characters, which is very much drawing on that genre of, um, supernatural horror that, um, Let's get this out of the way. Joe Hill, son of Stephen King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What every first review, <laughs> line, first line of every review of this comic series mentions that. But I think that it's drawing in that tradition a bit. Right. Okay. Um, but was there something specifically that made you think 90s? Cause I think the, I think the house, maybe it's the way they're dressed. I don't know. The, the way they're but dressed. The house, the house is just yeah. kind of timeless because it's your old Victorian. I think the way they're dressed is a factor. There's a sense of style, which seems quite dated, even by the time of publication. Uh, I think some of the frame of reference of the characters feels out of keeping with teenagers from that period. So we're talking late 2000s. Okay. And you have the British would-be punk. Uh, yeah, why keeps... is Spider Jerusalem in this comic? I was yeah. very confused <laughs> about that when he first showed up. You know, and then... On top of that, you have the actual kind of life that they're living. Now, I'm not American. I never went to an American school. But I did have a sense, even at that time, that teenagers coming up, and I would have been in my 20s at that time, teenagers coming up would have had a very much online existence. And I never had that sense of that being a reality right. in this world. No, yeah. It felt like a world where people go to ball practice and they go down to the diner and they hang out and they go to movies together and You're they right. go cycling in the mountains. Like there's this sense of You're like so a, right. Spiel, a Spielberg movie almost, yeah. you know, from that period. Yeah. And Stephen King as well riffs on that and a lot of horror writers who were following his model. Yeah. Yeah, you're actually right, because I was thinking, I mean, inevitably I was thinking of Stephen King while reading it, and I only know him from a few movies. I've never read a Stephen King book, but even I was like, oh, here's a group of kids and the New England house, and it really felt like a Stephen King thing, and I certainly was kind of associating it in my mind with that period, although you've articulated it, and I, I really hadn't, it wasn't concrete for me until you said so, but yeah, they're they're outdoor, all these kids are outdoor kids, and they never talk about endlessly about the youtube videos they're watching or whatever or or facebook facebook was very or, much a or, thing yeah or facebook I mean, they, know, they don't um i think this this series started in 2008 or something later. yeah 2008 2009 i would have i would have guessed um uh, i have got my they, cup there's so much talking and mm. that was one of the things i found it tedious about it so much people talk people talk about their feelings and no matter which end of the spectrum they're on they're pretty articulate about um, not, maybe our is not the word, but they know exactly how to vocalize what they're feeling. There's not, there's never really any. They're never wrong about themselves. I so that. maybe in that sense, it's it's a '90s product because it's so similar to Dawson's Creek, <laughs> which <laughs> yeah. had the, never had the same problem. <laughs> right. So, and I feel that very. It was it was it was tiresome. And I again, part of the problem was. For my first, the first two volumes when I came in and I was like, okay, this is going to be a horror comic. And I was like, where's the scares? Where's the scares? Because they kept, everything just kept, I felt it was delayed by pages and pages of dialogue of people just talking about okay. how they feel about things. Well, well, let's, let's discuss the plot quickly. Yes, yes. And then uh, we can have a little argument, sir. Okay. <laughs> um, so Lock and Key... Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez, as we said, uh, it's concerned with a family, uh, the Locke family. Hence the title, L O C K E. Come on. And yeah, <laughs> well, it all relates to the house that they live in, but we'll get to that. So um, they have recently gone. This family have recently gone through a horrific tragedy, where uh, the father, Rendell Locke, was murdered by a former student, and his widow Nina and their children. Tyler, Kinsey, and Bode 
have now traveled across the country, I believe from San Francisco, and they've traveled to New England to live in Key House, which is a family home uh, owned by Rendell's family, and they've inherited it. And the only other member of the Locke clan who's still alive is um, Duncan, I believe, an uncle, mm-hmm. who's still near, uh, relatively nearby. And uh, the family move into the house to uh, explicitly uh, get away from the trauma of losing the dad so, in such a horrific fashion. And while they're there, the youngest son, Bode, starts hearing and feeling the presence of what he discovers are keys that give him magical powers. Like if he uses keys in certain locks in the house or in certain objects, he can uh, assume an aspect or an ability. So the first one, I believe, is the ghost key. Um, Throughout the plot of the comic, as you mentioned, more and more keys are discovered, usually by a child or somebody who has innocence or a member of the lock family. And uh, that becomes an important plot point later. But um, there's keys like the Anywhere key, which is very, very important. The Echo key, uh, the Gender key, which we'll touch on, I think. The Head key, which is possibly one of the most uh, impressive uh, feats for Gabriel Rodriguez when he gets to explore that key. Um, The Mending key, um, the Omega key and the shadow key, which is related to the crown. And uh, all these keys give a power of some kind that seems to be associated with the metal the key is made from. And it's only in, I think, the penultimate volume of the series that we find out what this is all about. Yeah. So the structure of the series is these kids discovering these keys. And then Bode meets... Or it's, I think it's Bodhi, but um, somebody suggested that it relates to um, a lot of the names relate to home, so that it's abode. Oh. It's upon an abode. Okay. So Bode um, meets uh, a being that refers to themselves as an echo, uh, and is later referred to as Dodge, uh, appearing first as a woman who lives in the well, and she uh, they encourage uh, Bode to free them from the well. Uh, by bringing them the Anywhere key. And this is the antagonist, Dodge, uh, who is a demonic presence over the entire series, this sort of shape-shifting entity uh, that uh, Rendell previously fought uh, decades ago in the 90s. 1988. Oh, is it the 80s? Sorry. Um, So that's basically the plot. These kids are finding these keys and there's this demon that's trying to take the keys and they have to either hide the keys or fight back using them. And the other important plot point is that uh, adults can't see or acknowledge anything that's happening in Keyhouse. And they don't seem to be able to experience the magic that the kids uh, can see and feel and participate in. So they actually feel increasingly isolated from the adults in their life, which is thematically... Um, sort of a, a wedge between the mother Nina and her children. The mother who has herself uh, not just lost her husband, but she was sexually assaulted in the same incident um, by a friend of the her husband's killer, Sam Lesser. So, um, an argument can be made that the series is largely about trauma, about families dealing with trauma and violence and grief and uh, Certainly, at the over the majority of the final volume is concerned with the arc, arc of uh, fathers and sons. I was actually going to say, when you said that it's about trauma, I actually wonder how realistic it is, and I mean in the sense of these kids have, kids have witnessed a lot of crazy carnage, murders, not accidental deaths, murders. And um, I started losing track. It was a bit like a, a, a slasher movie almost. It got to a mm. stage where it's like, how many people have died now in the house? And at one stage, a character says, um, eight people have died in the last six months. And then the other person says, no, it's been ten in the house. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, is it that many? And then and I was almost at the moment I was wondering it. they said it out loud and I was like how are they still functioning and going to school and 
Um, I mean, there's an excuse for one character because she's magically had her fear removed, and I don't know if that uh, makes yeah, I, sense. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to. I was going to mention that. Yeah, right. I don't know if that really. I don't think they followed the logic through on that because I think their behavior would be even would be quite different if you had no fear. But anyway, I don't think that anybody. I mean, the mom becomes goes becomes an alcoholic. Uh, but, I mean, the kid, Bode, is really little, and he's witnessed a lot, and I just don't, I just feel like they should be much, much in worse condition than they were. And it seems to apply to, uh, all the generations. Um, I think, like, at the end, there's another, there's a huge slaughter, and they're kind of, and we're not seeing anybody in therapy for any of this. They just kind of get on with it. Yeah. I think you you got it right earlier on. Although I disagree with you in terms of it not being scary because I find it's a very disturbing comic book series. And okay. I've read it two or three times now and each time it chills me. But you nailed it on the head when you said dark fantasy. Yeah. And it was comparison... actually, sorry, uh, let me interrupt you for a second. I remembered it was when the shadow monsters showed up. And yeah. they're all different shapes, like one's a samurai and one's yeah. a wolf and something. And I was like, oh, the this Roman is centurion. not... And, yeah, a Roman centurion. I was like, oh, this is not a horror comic. This is a dark fantasy comic. And I kind of was able to appreciate it more once I crossed that. Yeah, I think that's point. a subjective experience of genre because, um, I mean, I, I still find a lot of kids' fiction, um, like Diane Wynne-Jones kind of stuff, you know, occasionally frightening. There's this sense of being a child reading this and experiencing that fear. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, The Lord of the Rings is not a horror novel. It's a fantasy novel. But like when I was eight years old and reading the scene on Weathertop, I skipped the chapter because it scared me so much. You know, <laughs> the Black Riders descend on the Frodo and Sam. Um, so I think there's a place for horror that is somewhat childlike okay. or YA oriented um, and I think this has horror elements and clearly it's indebted to Lovecraft not just in the title drop but this idea of um, body possessing demons that force you to experience pain as pleasure and all this kind of stuff like this this is horrific in conception um, although it doesn't as you say have so many uh, jump scares and uh, outright gore um, which I don't think necessarily defines horror either, no, but I can, see, I. I can see how you relate them to horror. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, when you talked about dark fantasy, uh, the leap I made in my head was to the Chronicles of Narnia, mm -hmm. which, like this, is about a group of children who discover a way to transition from an ordinary world into a fantastical world. They travel through a wardrobe uh, in a house into Narnia, which is somehow located within this wardrobe, and that's how they experience it. And they do things and they experience things which you would think, by your assessment of Bodhi, should have left them a quivering wreck. Mm -hmm. But because they're heroes in a fantasy, they uh. they you know they survive. They don't just they thrive. They they succeed. They become heroes. They become kings and queens. They're warriors and leaders and commanders of all these fantastical creatures. And I think there is a play with that genre the idea that you're in an adventure story. And the one that you mentioned before, were you referring to that issue, which is the month by month um, skipping ahead in time, where we see all the different ways Dodge is trying to attack them with different keys and Might there's all these different it's these one page vignettes of adventures yeah. and it's clear that by the end of the story a lot more has happened than we've actually seen on panel yeah well that was the dial h for hero issue so <laughs> in my mind because yeah. basically sure. we see and it's interesting because you named a bunch of keys in your summary of the plot there were a bunch of keys you didn't name and they were all ones that were in this issue because they're irrelevant there were they, yeah, there are things they there's don't encounter. One, one that makes you yeah. super strong, one that gives you wings, like, yeah. uh, and they were not, and, and we didn't get any introduction to these keys, and it, they just seemed. I wish there were fewer keys. Did there need to be this many keys? Couldn't this series have been a leaner three volumes? Uh, I think part of that is the sense of history that's tied up with Key House as well, because this is going back to the Revolutionary War against the British. It's been happening since then. 
the, the Locke family have been making keys right. and investing powers or their wishes in these demonic keys. And as a result, there is this huge collection of keys scattered around the house, and they're all tied to particular events or particular times. And I think someone suggested, and now Joe Hill and Robert Rodriguez are, sorry, not Gabriel Rodriguez, <laughs> whoops, um, are coming back with more lock and key stories set in different time periods. Mm -hmm. And there always was the sense that there's a lot more world here, a lot more story uh, entry points. And that's what the keys sort of represent. They, they represent different periods in time, which um, can be explored later. But this particular story is concerned mainly with those keys that I mentioned, with a couple of, like the angel key is important because it relates to uh, Rendell's friends and their production of uh, The Tempest, um, I, I wanted to mention, what do you think of this? Um, I think it's volume five. It's uh, dedicated, well, Joe Hill dedicates volume five for Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman. Huh. And there is a sense, this is an Eisner Award winning comic book. There is a sense that Lock and Key was being set up to sit alongside uh, Swamp Thing and Sandman. Well, and all, you know, you know what? and now they're doing a crossover. I will. I will. Uh, when the, there's a there's a Calvin and Hobbes issue, you know, that's kind of drawn in the style and almost laid out in a four panel Calvin and Hobbes yeah. thing. That's the issue Sparrow, which I think is one of my favorite issues in the yeah, entire thing. Yeah, but it's it kind of it jumps in like um, the Pogo issue of Swamp Thing out of nowhere. You're like, whoa, what is this crazy thing? But and again I'm not I'm not trying to be super negative about the comic, but Joe Hill is no Alan Moore. And I have although I haven't read anything else he's done but on this series, and I don't think this series really earned Again, it was a thing that makes it less I don't know, it didn't make it more scary to have the Calvin and Hobbes issue there. And I realized the Pogo issue was not there to be scary, but it was a kind of breather in Swamp Thing between all this horrific stuff that was happening. And it seemed really... It seemed out of place. I don't know, like, I don't know how seriously this comic was trying to take itself. I think that might have been... I'm sorry I'm really all over the map with this, but that might have been That's it good. too. Because... Like the town is called Lovecraft, and then did you, know, did you hear the story that they changed the name of the town to in the TV series? No, what was it? Uh, it's Joe Hill's uh, idea, actually, because he felt as if um, the more he's learned about Lovecraft, he didn't feel comfortable okay. celebrating Lovecraft huh. and maybe celebrating that uh, legacy of racism and bigotry and blah blah blah. Okay. I'm not saying blah 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 is to dismiss that. I'm saying as in yeah. there's yeah. a laundry list of complaints yeah. 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 to make. Uh, so they changed the name of the town to Matheson. Oh, okay. As in Richard Matheson. Right. Well, and then okay, so <laughs> so the town's called Lovecraft. I'm like, okay, that's just a nod. But then later on, well, it seems to be more than a nod. It's definitely more than a nod. Right. But then the neighboring town is called Voorhees. Oh. So <laughs> I'm like, where? How? What end of the scale are you on? Because actually, I kind of would love if this had been set in Voorhees, and it was a lot. I, I would have been able to handle it more because the amount of carnage that happens where people don't seem to really notice or, yeah. or care. Like again, it goes back to the trauma thing. But I mean, um, you know, maybe I mean again, you can draw a connection between this and the work of his dad because that's a major. I mean, you and I went to see um, it together. Yeah. The first film in the yeah. it uh sequence that just recently came out and that's a major plot point that the inhabitants of Derry, once they exit their adolescence they no longer acknowledge all the unpleasant things that are happening they right. don't seem to experience it right or yeah. they they know better than to call attention to it because then you just draw the attention of it right well a slasher like to me of war he's implies that people are going to get killed and it's not going to really matter if you know what I mean, right. it's just a, it's just a sure. pile of bodies, and nobody's trump really trump. Nobody's really trump times by it. Nobody notices by the next movie. There's no uh, legacy of like, oh how awful. Remember, I mean, if you think about, imagine if five kids died in a community, if there's a bus crash, mm. that's the most horrific thing, and it affects that place for decades. 
that's the next generation gone. Mm. Um, you know, that's what Adam McGoy and Sweet Hereafter was all about, was about the, a, a bus crash. I was, station, a bus I crash. was literally just thinking about that, yeah. And uh, there's a scene here where um, one kid gets possessed and he pushes another child, a child, like a six-year-old, eight-year-old child in front of a bus. The kid gets yeah. splatted. And it's just another chalk mark. If you know what I mean, I feel well, like it's not. Is that that's not technically true because even that situation, the mother of the ch- child who was killed, uh, curses that's the locks. That's true. That is because true. there yeah. there is this sense that if you go to the lock house, bad things will happen to you. I think the community know that because, as you say, Rendell Locke's entire high school class. Were yeah. killed. Yeah, like a huge number of people were killed. There's that story. But th- isn't that the trauma that they were experiencing? Like he left. Yeah. To get away from the town, but okay. like people still talk about, oh yeah, there's this horrible thing. Oh, a bunch of kids died in the drowning caves. Well, okay, that's good. That's interesting you pointed that because I didn't actually notice anybody talking about that, and that kind of freaked me out in this the, over the six volumes was. So we get a bit of. There's some bouncing around in time, and like I said, sometimes people say that thing that happened with Joe ten years ago or whatever, and you're like, well, okay, I have to remember this. It's not mentioned again or unpacked for a long time. So finally, then we get to this whole sequence in 1988. I found it all the whole 1988 sequence part two, but then I was shocked by the number of kids that got killed in this cave, and I was like, I don't really remember them. People talking about it constantly is. I mean, this is 15 years later, 20 years later? I guess it's 20 years later, maybe. 20 years maybe later. erased by, you know, or not erased, but... Mm. I think, I mean, like, again, not to push the boat out too far in terms of my defense of this series, but I do think there is something to when a small town experiences a tragedy, there will be a high high of grieving, and then it will dwindle away and it will just become folklore. And right. part of that is a, the process of burying that grief and that trauma and not talking about it. The important thing is mm. to not talk about it. If you do talk about it, you, you talk about it to, in illusions, in sort of gossipy whispers. So, right. hence, the, lo- the key house is a dangerous place, is something that is known, mm. but not explicitly described as to why. And the Locke family coming back is sort of allowed within the community because like well they've they've just experienced a worse tragedy like Rendell died and maybe there's even a sense that well he deserved to Mm. (laughs) I don't know but um I felt as if that was more the case that it's 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 a sense of the town has reckoned with this pain and they're trying to move on Mm. okay coming up spoilers Why can't adults in the story see what's going on at the house? What are the rules of this world? If you read this book and didn't understand a lot of points, Emmett is here to help. Also, missteps in how the book portrays certain minority groups. I'm continuing to republish classic episodes of Deconstructing Comics in reverse order, unlocked by our patrons' generous support. Last week I republished episode 59 from January 22nd, 2007, covering Marvel's Son of M series, Ennis and Dylan's Preacher, and Will Eisner's interview with Jack Davis. This week's is number 58 from January 15th, 2007, in which Brandon and I asked the question, why did 90s comics stink? The classic episodes can be found on our Facebook and Twitter feeds, by choosing the earliest months listed in the sidebar pull-down menu at deconstructingcomics.com, in publicly available posts on our Patreon page, or in the Patreon smartphone app. Classic episodes have been unlocked back to number 46. You can help to unlock earlier episodes by pledging. Patrons at $2 and up get outtakes from To the Bat Polls and sometimes from Deconstructing Comics. Patrons at $4 and up get extra full-length podcasts in which Mulele and I review superhero movies. And your pledge can help us move closer to making more fun stuff available. Check out all our goals and help us reach them at patreon.com slash deconcomics. You like cheap comic books, right? 
Well, I'm Professor Allen, and I talk about cheap comic books on the Quarterbin Podcast. In every episode, I'll dissect a single comic from my collection, as long as I paid no more than 25 cents for the issue. Forget about $4 new comics that you can read in four minutes, or crossover events that can cost 100 bucks to collect. Join me in the quarter bin, where even bad comics are a bargain, and good ones are a steal. The Quarter Bin Podcast is part of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Visit us at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search Relatively Geeky or Quarter Bin Podcast in iTunes. I guarantee it'll be worth every penny. But you're right, like a bunch of kids got killed. Yeah. Horribly. Yeah. Um, whether or not the method in which they died, because it does relate to the powers of the keys meant that the spell the keys have affected the town because uh, again they, it happened on the property of key house okay can I, can I ask you some spoilery mm. plot questions go for it I think you understand so, the series way better spoiler than spoiler spoiler for the listeners <laughs> yes carry on okay can you explain to me why can't adults see it because it's yeah, there is a key, there's a particular key, okay. and it relates to the door of the house. Okay. And anyone who passes through the threshold of the door, um, once you hit adulthood, you'll forget everything you saw. So the, that is, that power is in the key itself? Which key was it? I, I think it was actually named after the last person to use the keys. It was a German... Name. Oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. And I think it actually is just German for lock. Right. Um, so it's just a, it doesn't have any other power. It's a key that opens the front of the house. They talk about it as uh, like Rendell. It's it actually inspires Rendell's plot to go down in and to the Omega okay. uh, door gate yeah. and try and get more whispering iron from right. the demon dimension okay. because there's this sense of we're all going to forget. We all know we're going to forget okay. because we've gone through the threshold. Once we leave school, we will become adults. Okay. So he's like, okay, let's get loads of new keys and let's try and have a great summer. Or I don't know if he's trying to reverse the reverse the um, spell or find a way for them to continue to remember. There was some sort of plot he was, had half formed, and it's clearly this, he's this tragic hero in that he thinks this summer of love will last forever and he's going to try and keep it going with magical powers and of course it all goes horribly horribly wrong <laughs> so if you uh, oh this is so dumb if you enter the house without a key without using I don't think key, it's I it, think it relates to the threshold so okay so I'm not sure I don't quite know how it works offhand I know it relates to the the house itself and the entry point to the house okay. that if you are a young person using the keys yeah. and then you've gone through the threshold okay. you are now there's a ticking clock okay. yeah. that you know once you pass a certain age you'll forget everything what if you enter the house without crossing the threshold and you were an adult would you be able to see no Okay. Because it prevents it prevents adults from seeing it altogether. Oh, so the key uh, affects the memories created in the house, let's say. Correct. And that's why I'm suggesting, okay. uh, with the deaths of certain characters, uh, again, spoiler, 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 such as Mark, when Mark is killed by uh, uh, Dodge in the, in the woman's body, uh -huh. um, because it happened there, does that mean... Mark's parents don't even really remember <laughs> why they're grieving their son. <laughs> okay. You know? Yeah. And, and maybe no one else really remembers. Okay. Maybe that's sort of part of it. There's this sort of erasure. Again, I might be carrying too much water for this comic book series. If you didn't pick up on that, um, maybe I'm being subjective well, in no, my I think, defense. No, but I think it relates to the idea of there's a ticking clock of when you can experience the magic of Key House, and that's it. You, once, you, once you pass that that line you're at which of course raises the question when Randall and his friends who survived became adults yeah. most of them forgot with one or two exceptions yeah. which again relates to trauma like Ellie seems to actually remember uh, Dodge and she remembers things and that's kind of 
where it all goes wrong because she can still experience memories of what happened and she feels guilty about it. Um, what about Duncan? So Duncan was a little kid. Yeah. This horrible thing happens. He yeah. loses the one member of his his brother's um, uh, group of friends who was really kind to him, Dodge. Yeah. Dodge was really nice to Duncan. Um, so he's dead. A bunch of other people are dead or gone. Duncan can still remember magic, but he has no one else he can talk to about it. <laughs> he can still remember For, magic? Yeah, because he's only... He's like a kid. Uh, he was still a kid. Yeah, so but, it was something like 18 is when you forget. Okay. But then when he's an adult, at the end, he doesn't. he's shocked by everything he sees and he's yeah, forgotten. Yeah, he's forgotten. Okay. Yeah, because now he's an adult. Okay. But when he was a child and he was playing with the gender key and all the rest of it yeah. and you know he was experiencing all this magic it was a playful time for him yes he's like bowed as well he yes. seems like continually happy yeah um and this is this sense of innocence and then when his brother and his friends age out they've forgotten this yeah he somehow is stuck with all these memories and this magic but he can't talk to anyone about it that's good. That that's the horror story. Uh, <laughs> um, right. Okay. I think I I actually think I don't think you're giving it too much credit. I think part of it for me was it was really the plot. It was a Jenga puzzle with a lot of pieces, and I feel like they worked out every step of it from before they wrote the first panel on the first page. I think they knew because this guy's got to be standing over here, and this thing's got to be there. I feel like there was no room for there's no wiggle room in the plot to change anything or explore an idea that they weren't originally planning to explore i think it's like okay this has to ha this happened in 1988 and these five people were standing in this place and that's why this is here and that when it gets to volume five or six and the bad guy explains his whole evil scheme and twirls his mustache and oh, he by was the way, like just just to, just to interrupt you sorry yeah. um when he explains his motivations yeah. he explicitly says his motivations have changed like he had right. one plan and then he changed his mind over the course of the series and was like actually this yeah. is a better plan <laughs> but I think the writers probably had planned for him to change his mind if you know what I mean I don't think they changed their mind That's, oh sorry that yeah yeah mind. yeah I, I, I know I'm just trying to say that um, there wasn't like a single destination like there always right. was in the planning, but within the actions of the characters, there wasn't. Yeah, yeah. his motivations changed. Yes. they shifted. Yeah. Sorry, I should say their motivations changed because <laughs> uh, Dodge isn't. Uh, Dodge is is both male and female, like, and and switches back and forth. Yeah. Uh, where was I going? Jangle plot. Sorry. Planning. Um, forward planning. Yeah, a lot of planning, a lot of pieces. And, like, when they explained, like, there was a whole thing about him hiding the... He put, like, because you can use one key to go into your head and pull out memories, which are, like, little fairy creature kind of things that come out in various forms. He took something out, and he put it in a jar, and he put it on Ellie's dresser or something. I was like, I couldn't keep all the stuff straight that was going on. And to me, that was also another anti-horror thing, is so much... Here's a thousand plot points you've got to keep in your mind to keep track of where every where this jar is and how it's going to get picked up again twenty years later and all this kind of stuff and I was I I kind of glossed past it because I just couldn't I couldn't follow. Now at this point I was in the book's defense I had gotten bored and wasn't probably wasn't paying as much attention as I should have on the path right. leading up to these points. But I think you who enjoyed it more, probably kept better track of these kind of things. Like, here's another question I have for you, another spoiler sure. plot question. Can you please explain the well house and the echo and what the heck all that is? So the echo was uh, an insurance uh, scheme of Dodge's. So Dodge died. What about in before Dodge died? What was the well house and the key to the well house? The well house is a way of calling up a memory of someone who's died. Okay. So it's a specter, or what they call an echo. So uh, then later in the series, I think it's Tyler, uh, or is it Bode, he uses it to speak to his mother. 
And then, of course, there is a sequence with um, the dad. But that's not related to the wellhouse. That's related to the mending key and is also one of my favorite scenes in the entire comic is when Nina gets pissed and she's on a bit of a bender and she realizes she discovers the key. So she's in a drunken state. So this is interesting. So she's in a drunken state. So she actually experiences the keys. Whereas right. previously she's directly encountered things and she's not acknowledged that they happened. Right. But because she's pissed, yeah. she uh, she smashes all her plates and then she puts them in this closet and she locks it with the key. And when she opens the closet with the key, they're all mended. So there's this panel where Rodriguez has her smiling and she throws things in the air to smash. And I love this page so much because for me, I can't think of a better... Um, visual metaphor for alcoholism. <laughs> yeah, you know this the self destructiveness of this page. This her destroying her property. She's destroying all these plates because she'll fix it tomorrow. It's fine. <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> no, it turns out she can't actually do that. But then she confuses the notion of resurrecting Rendell mm-hmm. by putting his ashes in the um, in the same space and that doesn't quite work but it works in a strange new way with the sort of variant of this idea of the echo or spirit being pulled back and there's this sort of metaphysics about lock and key where there's definitely an afterlife like right. there, yeah. there is a place where yeah. souls go and you yeah. can call them back they do exist yeah. and there's also this demon dimension which is where Dodge is from which is very much the Lovecraftian idea of some elder god type things outside our reality they're trying to get in um okay so so, so the yep. well house so okay so if i went into let's say i go into the well house i use the magic key i'm a kid i'm young enough to use it um so i can so i can talk to a memory of anyone alive or dead is that how it works I think it's anyone who's died. Okay, anyone who's died. So I can talk to anyone. If I have a memory of someone that's died, I can talk to. If I, I wonder can if talk it's to my memory of that person. I wonder if it's memory or if you actually can invoke somebody. So okay. if you went in and you said George Washington, George okay. Washington appears and talks to you. You know. So how did uh, Luke Dodge, etc., use this to come back to life? So. Lou Caravaggio, who's nicknamed Dodge, uh, opens the Omega door and is infected. Or he doesn't open it, but he, I think Bode actually opened it. Yeah. Uh, Luke accidentally crosses the threshold yeah. and is then possessed by these uh, creatures. Yeah. By one of these creatures. And uh, as, a, as a way of not killing their friend, uh, Rendell decides what they're going to do is they're going to use the head key okay. and they're going to strip out all the things that Luke experienced while using the keys yeah. so that he doesn't um, commit act. Uh, the demon has no language to work with. There's no triggers, there's no memories for the demon to use because they're gone. He's, they've, they've emptied his brain. Yeah. And over the course of that stupid idea, um, Dodge, this demon rattling around in a teenage boy's body who can't articulate his hatred um, their hatred, sorry um, discovers this and takes one of those memories and puts them in a safe place in case their plan doesn't work and that was the thing that Ellie had to get to bring, bring them back Okay. So the, it, it's sort of while they dealt with the Dodge problem in the 1980s, yeah. there was an aspect of Dodge still around in a little tumbler jar. So it wasn't his soul; it was a memory of a mem- him. Yeah, like a little homunculus that would so uh, that could. The, the the one in 2008 is a manifest, a physical manifestation of a memory. Yes, that- correct. That can take physical reality that can because it used the anywhere key and through using the anywhere key was so able to how was enter the world Tyler able to unlock this the demon 
from the memory of... Because I'm assuming the memory doesn't actually have a demon in it. Does it? The, the the demon seems to exist still within. So it's like it's almost like a hologram. Like one okay. one piece contains the whole. Oh jeez, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah, okay, okay. This reminds me of that discussion we had about uh Batman versus Superman where I went I took a long bow in trying to justify the characterization of Lex Luthor. Right. <laughs> um okay, here's a here's a spoiler. Uh, a plus plus number one. How did Bode come back to life at the end? I didn't understand that he was just there again. There was a physical body after he'd been cremated. Cause didn't he? So the body was possessed, but wasn't there? Wasn't Bode's spirit in an animal? Okay. So they they put the animal through the animal door to recover Bode. Oh, oh. Uh? Okay. Is that it? I guess. Um, yeah, he wasn't an animal, but are you saying that the bode that... Uh, there's still... Holy moly. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I, I think you're right. Like, he went into a bird. He used the, the, the animal key to turn himself into... A, to put his soul into a bird. And you're saying yep. the bird went through some sort of door with some key to... I think that's what that's what Tyler then later so, did. Yeah. So if a bird goes through the an, an, an sorry if an animal goes through the animal door, they get turned into a human being. Well, as it happens, uh, Hill and Rodriguez have recently reunited to do some new Lock and Key stories, and that's exactly the plot of the first one they did. <laughs> I see. <laughs> two brothers, I believe. I haven't read it myself, but two brothers uh, turn a their dog into another boy. Okay, so ten years later yeah. they've explained this giant plot hole that <laughs> was very frustrating uh, reading it yesterday. Uh, okay. <laughs> I buy it. Um, now, can we take a moment to talk about the work of Gabriel Rodriguez? Yeah. Do, because... you, want, do, you, want, do you want my negative take first? <laughs> um, go for it. Okay, my thing is the art is awesome. Um... He, I think the figures are too cartoony for a horror comic. Uh, I found it was just kind of it was too round and bubbly and friendly to to invest any for me. And also the other thing I the other thing I didn't like about the art was um, when he would repeat panels. Now that's a shortcut. That lots of artists use, it's fine. But it's just, I also think there's an element of choice there. But yeah, of... I think there maybe is choice, but to have the same panel four times on a page, and just I mean, the, the art is amazing. Like he never cheats on backgrounds, and that's mm -hmm. that's, that's astonishing, really astonishing. About. And to do that for six volumes of a comic is just like holy moly. There's never a panel where it's just someone's head. There's always a background. Yep. Um, and the backgrounds are awesome. They look beautiful. And he, but I think the characters are cartoony looking, and the, there's a very thick. He has a very thick inking line, um, which also I think took me out. Took me out of it. But the repeated panels were one of the things that started to bore me. And the the Alan Moore scene transitions, which I guess are probably Joe Hill's fault, kept happening again and again, where you'd see mirrored panels between scene changes or mirrored dialogue, and I was like, come on. Get over this. But the repeated panels were dull for me, and I think the art was great. I just felt like it was not... It was great for a dark fantasy, not for a horror comic. That's my my hot take on it. Right, because I was going to talk about how much of Key House and the idea of suspense that relates to Key House and yeah. its presence um, is due to how Gabriel Rodriguez evokes the solidity and concreteness of Key House. 100%. And uh, I think the cartoonishness of the characters, because I think a criticism of the series has been that there are certain actors, and it's almost like there are certain body types that just keep getting recycled, okay. and there will be occasional like <laughs> slight variation of the facial detailing, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so to the point where by the end of the comic, Tyler has become Randall. Now, thematically that works because he has become Randall like he's become his father well I couldn't tell and... Duncan and Bode apart like the first time we see Duncan when they're, and the child, when they're children yeah I'm like oh this is a scene with Bode and then I was like what is going on and it was really yeah, yeah confusing to me so I think that's a 
you know, maybe that's just how he, I've read some of his other stuff, and I've noticed he does a lot more character work. But like his his background detail is consistently great. And I think, as I was saying before, this man used to be an architect. I think every reviewer has okay. mentioned that, so I, I, I hate to that. jump on the pile, but there you go. And I um I've always been struck with this sense of place and the sense of um, detailed design. And it's something that a lot of other comics lack. And I think it lends a lot to the comic series that, you know, Key House is itself a presence mm. within the book. And so much of that is important to the theme of these hidden spaces and maybe soft spaces within Key House where magic can happen and fantasy can be entered into. And then beneath Key House is the Drowning Caves, which is where the Lovecraftian horror sits and waits. And it's this descent into this dark, wet place. And uh, if you want to do more reading on this idea, uh, Julia Round wrote a paper, um, Spaces of Horror in Lock and Key. Um, Julia Round is one of my favorite uh, scholars of comics at the moment, particularly horror comics. Um, she's done a lot on hauntology. Uh, she, I think she wrote a book all about hauntology in comics. And yeah, she's a fantastic writer, a fantastic academic. But she spe- she wrote a um, a small presentation on uh, Lock and Key, and she talks about this sense of key house in the tradition of the Gothic castle. Mm-hmm. You know, everything from Count Dracula to uh, Udolfo to um, Dr. Frankenstein's lab within a castle. And this sense of it following into that tradition of gothic solidity. Um, I think that's a really interesting point of contrast. And I don't think, uh, with the exception of some uh, some other um, I've, his name is escaping me now unfortunately um, so Tim maybe delete that bit uh, <laughs> but, um, there, there is this tradition of gothic castle shorthand mm-hmm. and I think there are certain artists that are quite lazy in employing it there are others who buck the trend um, Rodriguez is not one, of the, uh, not one of the ones to take a shortcut here. This place has a presence and a style and sense of design that is so detailed. And I really love what it gives to the series in that I, have, I know exactly where the characters are whenever I yeah. see them on panel in Key House. Know where they are. Um, that is not... The, like there are, I've I've recently watched a glut of horror movies with my wife Stevie for uh, our own podcast, Hopscotch Friday, and we... I got really frustrated with the last one we watched where there were creatures like appearing out of nowhere and I had no idea where the characters were. Mm-hmm. I had no idea where they were in the town. I had no idea um, where the monsters were hiding. There was no sense of where they'd come from. Um, another big offender in this respect is the movie adaptation of Third Days of Night. Mm-hmm. The, the town of Barrow is either one street town or a small city. <laughs> it depends what part of the movie you're in. Uh-huh. Like It makes no sense to me. Key House, I always know where we are in the story in relation to the characters because it's all been laid out quite concretely. And um, you know, then he does his things like he does his uh, his um, um, was it Bill Watterson parody and yeah, he does a parody of Windsor McKay as well, which is astonishing. Uh, I think that was in one of the one shots. And um, this idea of Key House not as a haunted house. But as a strange, uncanny house. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the ideas that Julie Round really draws out. Like she's saying, a haunted house is a space where the memories of the deceased live on. It's, you know, the key house, it's, so it's, it's, it's a house that has been inhabited by ghosts. Key house is a living house. It's more like the Winchester house, I think. Yes, exactly yeah. like the Winchester. I think, and again, because love that. Um, sorry, uh, Alan Moore riffed on that in Swamp Thing. Yeah, the Winchester House is in Swamp Thing. Yeah. So I wonder if it's a tip of the hat there too. Yeah. Uh, well, it's more than a I tip. Found I mean, quote, the whole book is about it. Yeah. I, mean, the whole book I, I found the uh, I found the quote I was, I was thinking of before, um, and it's actually in the Julia Round essay. That's where I found it. Um, how many more people have to fall dead after visiting their house before people understand that it's them, them and that house? Mm. So I think that's, she cites it here as 546. I don't know if that's volume five, page 46. Yeah, but um, yeah, that's 
there is that idea of people in Lovecraft know that Key House is a dangerous place to be, mm. and you probably shouldn't be associating with the locks because right. you may die. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I just really wanted to shout him out, and um, at the risk of uh, once angering Joe Hill, uh, I would say that Key House has a lot in common with the Overlook, yeah. in that they're both sort of eerie spaces that That's true too, yeah. uh, you know have this sense of life to them. Uh, the Overlook is definitely, I think Stephen King considers it a haunted house, mm. right? But um, Kubrick invested it with a lot of weird energy all of its own mm. like the architecture of the overlook was so strange mm. that there was something about it that had its own energy that like as distinct from the ghosts within it i think uh key house has that too the sense of solidity that sort of transcends our world and is le- um there's aspects of this what's it called the the land of lang or where these demons come from it's sort of leaking into key house mm. um because it's full of these locks and keys that come from this demon dimension so I'm sure there's this transitional property of uh, strange uncanny energy that's leaking into the house anyway I really like the art Kumar I really <laughs> like the art. no the art is great it's great it's great for a, a dark fantasy is what I'm what I'm saying I, I'm saying that there's only one panel where I was a little bit like ooh and that's where um uh the the echo the the who's female in female form gets hold of a mirror and then when you see the face in the mirror it's a skull and it's an old such an old trick but it was kind of a that was the one creepy moment for me and the rest of it was um I mean you know by volume four up to volume four the the lead characters still have no clue who Luke is the kid that they're going to school with and is the main antagonist they have no idea. And we still don't know what he wants, even if he changes tracks, or he says he changes he changes his his uh, objectives. We don't know. We've not been told by Volume Four what he wants because we don't know anything about the Omega Door to the other dimension or any of that stuff. Four volumes in, we don't know where the keys have come from. We just had to endure them finding all these magical keys, like Wizard of Oz style, you know, for. Four volumes. It takes a very long time. That's kind of why I felt like, can we pull this thing back to three volumes? And can we? Does it have to be done in flashbacks? Like so many flashbacks. Does the flashbacks need to be this long? Can't this tightened up into a little package that's got more punch? Uh, but I think, again, like with Saga, I think I'm I'm in the minority here because I don't. I think this is. Like this is like a hit series, right? And now we've got a Netflix show. Um, so as always, I think I'm on the the wrong side of the popularity of it. <laughs> I um I looked up the uh, comic artist I was trying to allude to okay. before. So uh, Tim, don't delete that bit. <laughs> um, now you tell me. I had to do several undos to get it back. I was thinking of Richard Corbin. Oh well, I yeah well. <laughs> You know, what, you know in, you, in terms of like a sincere approach to gothic. Well, know? actually, when you were, I should have, because you know, I'm I'm the Corbin guy, and when you were talking about the haunted house thing and him being an architect, I was like, I wanted to say Corbin. I would have, I was thinking, should I interrupt him and say Corbin? So yeah, of course. Yeah, but I think what you were saying before, the idea is that we're supposed to be emotionally engaged by the locks. And by the things that are happening to Tyler and Kinsey in particular, Kinsey uh, has removed her fear and her grief using the head key. And again, to give a shout out to Gabriel Rodriguez, some of the stunning panels in this comic relate to the head key and the way he visualizes yeah. the psyches of these children. Yeah. We see their memories all stacked in these sort of dioramas in their head. And this this sort of idea, this visual effect, is so compelling. And unfortunately, the TV show just can't do that. Mm. It just can't do that same idea. Uh, they make an attempt at it, but there's no sense of the interiority of the characters outside looking in. Mm. They, they, they sort of enter into a fantasy space. 
and that's the idea. That's the sort of oh, we're now in um, Kinsey's head, and oh. it looks like a mall because she's a teenage girl. And girls like malls, um, <laughs> but she's going through this stuff where she's removed her uh, grief and her sadness and her fear. I think. Sorry, it's her fear yeah. and her grief. And then Tyler is going this through this stuff where he has this sort of doomed romance with this uh, girl who's not like the other girls. And uh, um, he's got this friendship with Dodge, who's sort of inveigled his way into his life, uh, that he slowly starts to get sick of him because the anachronisms start to build up, which I thought was a nice touch. And then we also have the storyline of Bode and his friend Rufus, who is uh, Ellie Waden's kid, and he's this character who um, has a. Um, I think some people have described it as autism. I don't know if it was it actually on panel described as autism. No, but it's it's, um, it's a neuroatypical behavior, or whatever it is, and uh, a lot of people complained about the TV show that the character in the TV show uh, doesn't have the same vocal pattern and doesn't have the same sort of complete mm. freeze on his social interactions that Rufus has where he has to only interact with people through toys and they were saying oh it's a shame I did not like that aspect of the book mm. <laughs> I did not like the depiction of this kid of his condition I did not like the almost again it felt like a throwback to how mental illness and disability and neuroatypical uh, conditions are portrayed in fiction. Yeah, the fact that he can go into Rufus can go into the key house and see ghosts there. Yeah, he's got a special real, power. That's a, yeah, just that was a real autism cheat. You know what I mean? That's awful. I yeah. really don't like that. Yeah. Like it goes back to the issue where they they change their their skin, their yeah. skin color, and all of a sudden they had what it's like to be black in America experience. Yeah. I was going, oh my god. I am curious black like Lois Lane. Well, yeah, yes, exactly. And also, well, I also didn't like that um, as a child, Duncan keeps playing with the gender key. Again. That's his yeah, Duncan. This, so it, Duncan is a homosexual, but he's not transsexual. He has no desire to be a woman. As an adult, we don't see that. We don't see him wearing dresses or wishing he... We don't see any of that. He's just a... He's a and, uh, he's, like maybe he did. Maybe he did experience maybe he that. Because like, it's not... It's not true. And it's, it, he's a child. Uh Maybe he did, but it's not dealt with within the story. I feel like the, the story presents it as if that him playing with that key yep. is related to his attraction to men. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and because there's nothing to tell us otherwise, that's the only conclusion we yes. can come to. Yes. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't dealt in a way that I felt was <sighs> descriptive enough. Yeah. Um, you know... I, a child experiencing sexuality at that age is not unusual. Uh, so then talk about it. Yeah. You know? Um, but I, I just felt the way it was done was almost, again, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more. He wants to, he, he likes dudes. Yeah. And <laughs> well, it's kind of with the race issue too. I mean, at the end of the issue, it's like, oh, we were black for and people, we were treated so horribly. And then the, it's, there's like, the police are going to be looking for black kids and like, oh, that's so terrible. And, and that's kind of it. It's one page of conversation about it, and then it's not... It doesn't yeah, come up I, again. And my I, thing is, you should really just not... Don't address it. Don't do not do it in the first place. If you... If all you I, can... I, I get very... Yeah, I get very frustrated with the depiction of racism as well within yeah. the comic, because there's these two orderlies, and they're caring for um, a friend of Randall's who is in in this um, she she experienced this traumatic event and it turns out that she actually had a bunch of her memories removed um, by the head key so all she can see all she, she can actually intellectualize is this white space where her brain and memories used to be like there's nothing there she's a void mm -hmm. right so she keeps saying white and they think she's afraid of white people so they accuse her of being racist mm -hmm. towards white people and they're racist towards her because she's a black lady and their racism is so on the nose and obvious. Yeah. I want <laughs> a depiction in fiction of racism that makes it an everyday well, thing. Say, what about not the... to endorse it, not to endorse it, yeah. but to show how insidious it is, that it's simply there. Well, what about the homophobes? It's it. the same with the homophobes. Yeah. They're so 
vocal about it. Every line of dialogue from their mouths is how much they hate gay people. And then they're afraid of AIDS. And yeah. it's really like, and I put that on Hill's writing. Like yeah. that's the writing of the scene. Yeah. Uh, I think whatever Rodriguez was right, working with in the script is confusing because the, I thought they were uh, butch uh, uh, homosexual women. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because yeah. of how they, I mean, yeah. and again, that's on me. That's my prejudice. Yeah. But like, oh, that's, how it seemed to be codified to me yeah. and then every word out of their mouth was gosh we hate gay people it's like that bit in Preacher with the Ku Klux Klansmen where they're standing around in the field and they're waiting for Odin to turn up who's mm-hmm. the, the little scrawny racist dude and they're saying oh that guy is really annoying and saying what do you mean he says all he talks about is hating mm-hmm. black people that's all he wants to talk about I mean myself and Joe Bob the other day we had a great conversation about tractors and <laughs> your man walks up and says, oh gosh I sure do hate those and offensive word mm-hmm. and <laughs> it's it's a depiction of racism it, Garth Ennis and, and how Steve Dillon depicts the Ku Klux Klansman and Odin but it's a depiction of racism that pokes fun at how completely ridiculous yeah. it is yeah. to hate a race like to hate a race of yeah. people for no reason you just hate them and it motivates you and that's i mean that's not quite what i was describing a moment ago in terms of like the everydayness of it but in terms of if you're going to do something that is so on the nose go that way make it ridiculous whereas i thought there was something weird about these two women so terrified like homophobic literally homophobic Mm. they're terrified of gay people and uh, something weird about that i just it just didn't feel yeah. Yeah. it felt it felt it felt um superficial yeah um and again like uh i i will stand for uh, gabriel rodriguez's work in this series because i think the geography of lovecraft the the layout of the key house uh, even the soft feature and characters i really enjoy i really enjoy his art i really enjoy the amount of work he put into it i think the fact that this was a monthly comic book series in seasons but still is incredible yeah, there are sure. moments in this series and uh, i've done a lot of reading before we started talking tonight uh trying to find comic reviews from that period um, the most people will tackle them on is the idea of the um, uh, being black for a day. Mm. That's the one people, mm, I'm not sure about this, but then they'll try and turn it into, um, well, what have we learned about this? As opposed to, it's just not great writing, guys. Yeah. Like, it's just, you know. Yeah. Um, but they don't touch Rufus. They don't touch the gender stuff with Duncan. They don't touch the two women being coded in this really strange way and and being literally homophobic uh, in a very obvious fashion um i haven't seen that stuff discussed maybe i'm not looking hard enough Mm. but uh i thought those are issues and the television series notably doesn't have a gender key doesn't have a race key in the television series there's a key which is just a shape-shifting key okay and it's pivotal to a twist in the last episode of the first season there's this big reveal. And, oh my God! You know, there's this whole other. Anyway, I won't spoil it in <laughs> case you do watch the series. Um, and it relates to all those plot elements that the race key and the gender key uh, were involved in, but it doesn't. It, it sidesteps those issues. Okay. Because then it's like, all right, we don't need to talk about that specifically. Right. <laughs> you can just people shape shifting. It's fine. <laughs> that, that those. I mean before we even started talking I really wanted to give that little shopping list yep. of uh, issues I had <laughs> yeah okay um, okay what are we going to say about this overall what's our what's our two sentence summary where do we stand I think I uh, my feeling is again I, I came in uh, thinking it was a horror comic didn't like it as a horror comic, liked it more as a dark fantasy. Overall, it was too long and complicated for me personally. But um, I actually would recommend it to people. I know people who would like that kind of story. So it's not, I don't think it's, and again, the art is awesome. So Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I will gently disagree with you as I've been trying to. Okay. I, uh, I've reread this. Uh, I think I, I think it's three times now. Yeah. Um, I find it quite chilling. I find it quite disturbing. 
uh, eerie, I think. Um, and, and that frightens me at times. There are passages that still frighten me in this comic book. Uh, I admire the structure of it. I admire how much confidence Joey Hill has in his writing that he can lend this, lead us down the garden path with all these characters and then in the penultimate volume drops a bunch of history that explains the events that have occurred in the previous volumes mm -hmm. and have been alluded to but we never actually saw and it somehow fits mm -hmm. one of the frustrations I have with the television show is they actually get into that in the first season which I thought was a huge mistake but the stuff of the Revolutionary War is great so well. they've, they've done it the way I wanted it I think, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the television series is much more conventional, and I okay. think they probably had a sense of um, most people won't like it if we take this approach. Mm. So it has been simplified, okay. and it is also far closer to an unquestionably YA property. Like mm. um, yeah. this is a, a supernatural thriller in the YA genre mm. for a television show. I think in the comic it's bordered between dark fantasy and horror mm -hmm. um insofar as the things dodge does and the things that happen off panel are horrific mm -hmm. and then some of the things that happen on panel are just brutal in their um speed mm -hmm. the, the way people die so suddenly and abruptly um is quite is quite scary so i am um, i really enjoy this comic i've come back to it a few times and I think it's a worthy uh, comic book series to follow as a model because it has a beginning, middle, and an end. Mm. And it has a concept. It, uh, it addressed that concept quite in a quite structured way. And, and it wrapped up. And hey, I am all in favor of comic book series that end. <laughs> yeah. Lock and Key is published by IDW. Support this and all of our shows by joining us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash deconcomics for more details. You can also help us out by reviewing us on Apple or any other podcast source. Do your shopping at deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon so that we get a percentage of the sale. And share our episodes on your social media. We appreciate your support in bringing Deconstructing Comics, Critiquing Comics, and To the Bat Poles to a larger audience. Help us get higher in podcast rankings by subscribing. It's free, and you'll get episodes as soon as they come out. And even if you think you don't have a podcast app on your phone, you probably do. But of course, you can always listen to all our episodes at deconstructingcomics.com. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us, and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. Next week, I'll be joined by Joe and Kendall from the Wayne Manor Memoirs podcast. But no, we're not talking about Batman. Instead, we'll be digging into one of the most controversial superhero storylines of the past decade, when Captain America became the leader of Hydra. It's Nick Spencer's Captain America Steve Rogers series and the event it led into, Secret Empire. Why was it so controversial? What was the story trying to say? That's next week. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>